Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Fellow and Director of the Europe Program. Uh, and we are delighted to see so many uh, friendly faces, a full audience, because we're about to have the great privilege of hearing uh, from what I consider one of the thought leaders uh, in Europe on defense issues. We are delighted to welcome Minister of Defense Stefan Wallen to be with us today, Finnish Minister of Defense. Um, as Minister of Defense, which you're almost coming up on your one year anniversary, I uh, was appointed minister in June of 2011. Prior to that, uh, he has served with distinction as the Minister of Environment, the Minister of Culture and Sports, uh, and he began his career as a journalist. But I think I have, there's one thing you told me, Mr. Minister, last evening that I think is my favorite title. He knew he was going to be a dedicated transatlanticist at the young age of 15 when, in 1982, he joined the Finnish American Association. So I, I'm not sure if I knew at 15 I was going to be a dedicated transatlanticist. I grew into the job. But uh, and we are delighted when he, when he puts that uh, pin with the Finnish and the American flag on, he said, I have an older pin from 1982. So we are very grateful. Uh, Finnish Defense Forces have served with distinction in Afghanistan. Finland has been uh, an extraordinary partner in the NATO Partnership for Peace program. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, we rely on our Finnish colleagues to help us understand the dynamics in the region. And as they certainly excel in crisis management operations, what a treat it is to have the minister with us. Please join me in welcoming him, and uh, we'll get started. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Heather. It's really a great pleasure and honor to speak here at the CSIS today. Very glad to be, to be here. I would like to use this opportunity to share some thoughts with you about um, multinational defense cooperation. And I will do this from a European NATO partner country's perspective. The urgent need for multinational Defense cooperation concerns all European countries, whether allied or non-allied. We all strive to develop military capabilities that efficiently meet our security challenges at home as well as abroad. At the same time, uh, this, uh, we experience a growing gap between capability requirements and resources available for the defense sector. For the foreseeable future, public funding for all the government sectors is likely to remain, remain very tight. And that concerns, of course, also defense. Defense expenditure is failing, is falling in the short term and uh, at best recovering slowly in the medium term, I say at best. Providing the capabilities we need is going to be a huge challenge. But we have the responsibility to provide them. That's a fact. I firmly believe we will only be able to meet that responsibility with a new mindset. A new mindset based on prioritizing cooperation closely with chosen partners and above all, of course, focusing on what we keep, not just what we cut. The current state of uh, public financing is uh, forcing us all to take far-reaching measures. We face rather brutal decisions. The challenge is to maximize the capabilities we can squeeze out of the resources available. But um, this is not necessarily only bad news. Sometimes necessity drives innovation and also breaks down old barriers. With budgets so tight, we need to reconsider approaches and ideas that previously may have seemed to be too much, so to say, out of the box. And we need to look for multinational solutions instead of unilateral solutions. We should not be afraid to explore new initiatives that add value to everyone involved. There are many different ways of working together, also new ones. 
The challenge is how to work together towards smart cost savings in order to cut fat and not to cut muscle. That is why Finland is actively pursuing collaborative in initiatives. In addition to the bilateral cooperation, NATO and EU frameworks, and Nordic Defence Cooperation, we are engaged in the so-called Northern Group of Nations, which includes the Nordic and Baltic countries, the United Kingdom, Germany, Poland and the Netherlands. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a mixed record with multinational defence projects from the past. One classic example of a successful project has been the C-17 Strategic Airlift Consortium. Small and medium-sized states seeking large and expensive platforms often have no other options than multinational arrangements. Our budgets and national requirements are simply too small to buy such equipment. The C-17 consortium was good news for Finland also because it was opened for interested non-NATO nations, even though the arrangement was prepared in NATO framework. Looking to the future, we would like to see more similar initiatives. Another successful example has been the Sea Surveillance Corporation of the Baltic Sea. This corporation began in 2009 and it will reach operational phase during this year. The basis lies within bilateral maritime surveillance cooperation between Finland and Sweden. Our good experiences were the drivers for wider corporations in the Baltic Sea area. The final step has been a European-wide project called Maritime Civilians Initiative, which is currently conducted in the European Defence Agency under Finnish leadership. The Sea Civilians Corporation in the Baltic Sea is also an excellent example of cost effectiveness. No new civilians infrastructure has been purchased. We only needed software to link nationally produced data together and to create a network forum for daily cooperation. Despite the positive steps taken in some smaller groups, the pace to find innovative multinational solutions together has so far been slow. Deepening defense cooperation brings up fundamental questions related to the trust between nations and the degree of self-sufficiency in defense capability. A complex set of challenges derives from the needs to share and to specialize. While a country can provide added value to the common pool by developing a niche capability, it will need to rely on others regarding some other capability areas. What if one of the participants chooses to opt out? Again, a new mindset is needed, and we get used to the idea of not having it all by ourselves. These are complicated issues, especially for smaller countries. When it comes to countries outside collective defense arrangements, such as Finland, challenges are yet multiplied. It is a fact of life that the countries covered by mutual security guarantees have more freedom of action in the development of their, de their defense systems. Nevertheless, it has become clear that a country of some 5 million inhabitants, like Finland, cannot sustain complete or balanced armed forces on a national basis alone. One basic question that I keep on asking my fellow politic and political decision makers is the following. Which is more important, national sovereignty or national interest? My own answer is the latter counts more. In any case, the best way to secure both of them is multinational cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, in those multinational projects that have succeeded, a certain key element seems to be to apply. The countries involved should share mutual confidence and trust, similar quality of military forces and similarity of cultures. And these key elements no doubt played a role for us in Finland when we decided to intensify defense cooperation with our Nordic neighbors. The Nordic Armed Forces are based on similar fundamentals in terms of tasks, objectives and concepts, making broad cooperation both possible and preferable. The cooperation is based on the conviction that there is much to be gained through shared experiences, 
cost sharing, joint solutions and joint actions. Mutually reinforcing cooperation and capability development constitutes a supplemental approach in providing the capabilities and forces required by NATO and the Euro European Union. The Nordic Defence Cooperation has long traditions starting already in the 1960s with cooperation in the field of peacekeeping training. Later on, the cooperation has developed to cover armaments cooperation and building operational capabilities. We aim at cost effectiveness, but also to reach operational, financial, technical and industri industrial benefits. One of the strengths in the Nordic Defence Cooperation is its uh, flexibility, making it possible for the participants to choose in which program, project to participate. I guess we could call this Smurgos board. <laughs> this means that um, in many cases the work is carried out on a B and a trilateral level. We strive for closer coordination in all defense areas from strategic studies through acquisition and logistics, education and exercises to operation. For example, our air forces conduct frequent cross-border training and exercises, taking the advantage of using Finnish Swedish and Norwegian airspace and facilities. Another noteworthy example is the Nordic Battle Group. Preparations for the Battle Group have proved to be a real catalysator for defense reform. The Nordic Defense Corporation, called Nordefco, is unique in many respects. Not only the long history, but also the exceptional momentum that has been created to boost the cooperation is very special. It has remarkably enhanced our mutual understanding and also interoperability. But the pace in capacity has been rather slow. This is still very much a work in progress. And it's far too early to tell when our new structures reach and deliver real added value compared to the cooperation we have carried out for decades. Many say that uh, we still need more time to develop and mature. But one could also say that even more importantly, we need concrete examples of new type of cooperation. No quick wins, but actual progress. So, what are the challenges that we have faced and may face? I guess these challenges fit generally for defense cooperation between any groups of countries. Above all, it's important to understand that it takes time for the multinational cooperation to be efficient and to overcome friction. For the Nordic family, and despite the unique momentum we have had, capability development has in fact taken more time than expected. The Nordic countries do share many similarities, but at the same time, we are also different. For instance, Finland and Sweden are EU members and NATO partners. Norway belongs to, no to NATO, but not to EU. Denmark belongs to both NATO and EU, but does not participate in EU's common security and defense policy. This is of often considered to be our strength, but it's obvious that the cooperation, especially in the field of defense, is poses, is poses some challenges. Another constant challenge to maintain, clearly, uh, to maintain clarity of intentions. If deeper cooperation is to leave all partners satisfied, there has to be clarity and arrangement, agreement on what purpose the initiative is to serve. This common understanding will determine the scope, form and depth of joint projects in practice. Thirdly, even if our legislation is quite similar, there are still some national rules and regulations that sometimes slow down the process. There are also issues such, like, such as cultural differences and bureaucracy. Yet another factor we have found creating friction in, is, is different in industrial solutions. And, well, as always, there is the usual organizational resistance against change. But despite the challenges, I think we are on the right track. Similar challenges apply also to the enhanced multinational defense cooperation within the European Union. The momentum in the EU was 
initiated one and a half years ago at the meeting of, of ministers of defense in Ghent. Strengthening defense cooperation through pooling and sharing capability projects has already led to some promising results. A package of concrete initiatives have taken shape, including air-to-air -air refueling, medical support, training and maritime civilians. However, the need to do more remains very urgent. The level of complexity tends to multiply as the number of nations involved increases, but also, of course, the amount of possibilities increases. Ladies and gentlemen, Finland has uh, participated in NATO's Partnership for Peace program from the very beginning for more than 15 years now. And we continue to use all partnership tools available for us to the fullest extent. Transforming military capabilities and enhancing interoperability are keys to operational success for both NATO nations and partners. NATO's defense planning and force evaluation tools available for partner countries as well as NATO exercises and training and education programs are the most important elements in our partnership cooperation. We have used all of these for transforming our armed forces and enabling us to contribute capable troops to NATO-led operations. No matter what institutional shape NATO's global partnership arrangements may eventually take, these tools should be maintained, further developed and offered to new participants. Current and future threats are likely to transcend geographical borders. Therefore, instead of geography or history, we should look for flexibility, self-differentiation and pragmatism as the guiding principles. We have been satisfied with the way these principles have been applied to NATO's partnership reform. Consolidating the currently fragmented, fragmented partners, partner categories and focusing on mutually beneficial activities could save heavy administrative burden and lessen duplication. But most importantly, this would contribute to cost effectiveness and improved operational output. Each partner country has to find a solution which best suits its needs. But it's cruci crucial to have a capability-driven approach. Let's take Finland as an example, just by accident. In the early years after joining the Partnership for Peace program, our focus was on ap applying NATO standards and partnership goals in order to improve the interoperability of the troops reserved for international operations. During the past couple of years, Finland has chosen to utilize partnership goals for the full range of capability development. Another new element is our participation in the NATO response force. Finland considers the NRF a central tool for transforming European armed forces and appreciates the possibility of partner participation. We welcome NATO's plans to expand exercise schedule and focus on NRF as put forward by the Secretary General in the Connected Forces Initiative. The US plans to rotate units from, the, from an American-based brigade combat team through, though Europe further add, to the via viability of the NRF concept. For this year, Finland has contributed a deployable CBRN laboratory with a detachment of some 50 experts for the NRF response forces pool. We also have a solid plan concerning our NRF participation for coming years. Next in line will be the will be Army Special Op Operation Unit, followed by Air Force F-18 Fighter Squadron and Navy ambivious task unit. Ladies and gentlemen, as um, NATO's Chicago summit approaches, we have identified four key areas where we should increase our mutually beneficial cooperation. These ideas were listed in the Swedish-Finnish Food for Thought paper delivered in March. First of all, develop the political dialogue in flexible formats. There is a need to further develop methods for dialogue and cooperation in flexible formats with advanced partners. 
This is related both to regional and thematic issues at political as well as expert level. Since uh, NATO's partners constitute a very high, a very heterogeneous group, it's necessary to tailor the cooperation according to the diver diverging interests, objectives and capabilities of individual partners. We see flexible formats as one tool to this end. The anti-piracy meeting last September and the cybersecurity meeting last November made a very good start. We now need to make sure that this indeed only was a start. Flexible formats should be actively used so that they can become a meaningful tool for cooperation. Secondly, deepen cooperation with advanced partners for future operations. Particular attention should be given to the involvement of advanced partners in all the stages of future cooperation, including planning and preparations. At the current, current large-scale operation in Afghanistan will soon come to a close. It will be important to find new ways to preserve and deepen cooperation with advanced partners. Thirdly, enhance involvement in capability development. Capable forces are essential for multinational operations. Further attention should be given to armaments cooperation as well as extended use of training and exercises to increase interoperability, interconnectivity and preparedness. Again, we have to keep on working together in order to not to lose the enhanced level of interoperability gained through common engagement in Afghanistan. But this, of course, is a two-way street. By enabling partners to develop a high level of interoperability, NATO gains partners with can, which can, so to say, plug and play in NATO's operations and other activities. In the light of the upcoming summit, we are especially interested in smart defense. We hope that willing and able partners would be, could be closely involved in the work being done in NATO on multinational approaches and in the discussions concerning small, smart defense. It's also essential to coordinate the work done in NATO and European Union. The fourth idea is to in intensify regional cooperation. For example, Nordic and Nordic Baltic security and defense cooperation, as well as engagement in the Northern Group, are of vital interest for Finland. This kind of cooperation and networking will improve wider European security and is as such important to the partnership with NATO. We just have to ensure that it's complementary, not duplicating. Well, in addition to these four areas I just mentioned, we need to make sure that the European Union can present a concrete package in Chicago. We should uh, reiterate EU's commitment to take greater responsibility on the international scheme. We also need to outline the potential added value EU can offer in the field of capa cap capability development, including the concrete project already taken forward in the EU framework. After all, EU members are bound together by a single market, as well as a common currency and legislation. I won't comment the currency right now, of course. I think it deserves its own speech. But our defense cooperation does not take place in a vacuum, since all sectors in the government are interwoven together. Dear friends, I now be talking for quite a while about the urgent need for deepening multinational defense cooperation. At this point, some of you may wonder why on earth Finland still remains outside NATO, the most successful and important defense alliance in the wide Euro-Atlantic area. Well, the reasons behind Finland's policy and military non-alliance still lie deep in our history, and explaining this in depth would take me at least another hour and a half. But I just want to note that we're all well aware of NATO's role in safeguarding also Finland's security during the long decades of the Cold War. The United States' engagement in Europe through NATO allowed Finland the luxury of prospering as an independent, non-allied nation. Finland is not a member of 
a military alliance, but cooperates with NATO and maintains the option of applying for membership. Finland will not prepare a membership application during this government's term of office. Finland will evaluate a possible NATO membership on the basis of its own national security and defence policy interests. We will work to develop cooperation between the European Union and NATO and recognise NATO's importance as the key forum of European security policy. Finland has greatly benefited from partnership with NATO. And while benefiting, Finland has also been able to contribute for our common security and stability through NATO's operations and the partnership network. The world around us is uh, integrating even faster and deeper than before. Finland is an integral part of the Euro-Atlantic community. We share the same undivided values, interests and responsibilities with other countries around us. This is a fact that will keep I will keep reminding also my compatriots. What I try to argue in my brief remarks is that all nations need more effective, deployable and usable capabilities. The only way to get there is to do more together. And while speaking about multinational cooperation, we should of course not forget the importance of bilateral cooperation. Bilateral relations lay the basis and contribute to deeper multinational arrangements. This has been the case also with the Nordic Defence Corporation. For Finland's defence sector, the United States is by far the most important bilateral partner. I always keep in mind how former US ambassador to Finland, Her Excellency Bonnie McElveen Hunter, used to describe relations between our two countries. She said, Finland is the best ally we never had. The fundamental question is uh, not only about belonging to one organization or another. I believe that we will see an increasing number of different groupings involving both NATO and EU nations. What brings these groups together are political will, know-how and resources. NATO and EU should facilitate cooperation and make sure that bureaucracy or inst institutional fracture will not lead to unnecessary duplication and waste of our diminishing resources. The Finnish approach in this is to build a network of carefully targeting, targeted cooperation with key partners, with focus on getting things done, not on producing more paper or more bureaucracy. Such an approach allows natural partnerships and regional groupings to flourish. The point is to engage in multinational cooperation in such groups which generate real added value. To create and maintain the necessary core capabilities needed in future multinational operations and to do this with reasonable burden sharing. I will finish my remarks with a quote from the, form, from the former Finnish president Martti Ahtisaari. President Ahtisaari ended his Nobel Peace Prize lecture in December 2008 with the following words. If we work together, we can find solutions. Peace is a matter of will. End of quote. And I would apply this thought by concluding that also multinational defense cooperation is a matter of will, is a matter of mindset, and therefore also a matter of will. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> well, Mr. Minister, thank you so much. You offered us a smorgasbord of uh, a really concrete and pragmatic uh, ideas and concepts um, from really strengthening and accelerating 
NATO's partnership for peace. And certainly it's, it's a clarion call uh, for giving those advanced partners the opportunity to do even more. Your, your notes on smart defense, multinational cooperation uh, could not have been uh, uh, more important. So I'd like to begin, if I may, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask the minister one or two questions. And then I'd like to bring you into the conversation. And uh, we have microphones. If you could raise your hand and wait for that microphone, that's all important. We're streaming this live, so we want our, uh, our colleagues that are watching us uh, to be able to listen to your question. If you could identify yourself and your affiliation, and we always ask that you uh, keep the comments short and the question provocative So uh, when you ask that, so uh, when we get to that. But Mr. Minister, you've highlighted really the Chicago agenda, partnerships, smart defense capabilities, but you missed one. And I'd like to bring you to Afghanistan. You were, you were in Afghanistan in March. You had an opportunity to meet with your counterparts as well as colleagues NATO. And I would like your impression because a lot of the Chicago summit will talk about transition, will talk about uh, how we leave Afghanistan and what that post-2014 environment looks like. So I'd welcome your thoughts on that. And my second question, I would be completely remiss if I did not ask you a question on the Arctic. CSIS has a, uh, an Arctic project here, and I'm, I'm completely obsessed with the subject. Um, uh, so we're going from Afghanistan the, to the Arctic. If that's not a global partnership, I don't know what is. Uh, Finland has uh, signed the uh, International Search and Rescue Agreement, working on negotiating with the other Arctic Council members an oil spill and response agreement. I would love your thoughts on Finland's readiness, its capabilities, and the multinational cooperation that you see emerging in the 21st century Arctic. So oh, I did my part. I asked my two tough questions. You start thinking of yours. So Mr. Minister, please. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. Afghanistan is, of course, I think one of the main, the most important issues on the, the Chicago agenda. And um, we know, of course, that trans transition is, is right now in process. And it's very, very important that the transition succeeds in the way it has been meant to succeed, also talking about the schedule and, of course, <clears throat> the capability of the, the Afghan National Security Forces to take the responsibilities that they are, they are expected to take. But um, they won't take it as a kind of automatic process, but because we need a very, very uh, comprehensive approach talking about the future of Afghanistan. It's not only about the national security forces. I think the, the most important thing is that the international community uh, remains committed to Afghanistan also after 2014. And that's of course puts a lot of pressure on the post-ISAF operation. It should be functionable, it should be visible, and I think the word visible is quite important because um, in that it, it's also included a strong signal to, to whom it may concern that the international community has not turned its back on Afghanistan. It remains committed and it remains present in Afghanistan. This signal is very important from the, the Afghan government's point of view, the civilian's point of view, the Taliban's point of view, and also the neighboring countries, for instance, Pakistan's point of view. And that, of, of course, also uh, requires a lot of, of commitment by the international community in a financial manner. We need uh, a package that um, could be adopted in uh, Chicago, including uh, commitments, also financial commitments from the partner countries, from the international community, from the US, and also, of course, from the Afghan, Afghanistan government to be able to secure uh, functioning a budget that will that will secure functioning security forces in the long in the long run we can't afford any backlashes talking about afghanistan we can't afford any disasters such as afghanistan in fact have have experienced twice after 1989 and after 2001 when the international community in fact did not take the responsibility it should have taken uh, because if we face a backlash 
if we would face a backlash. Every, all sacrifice is made so far, talking about, of course, money is money, but all, all the, the human suffering, the, the lives of the international soldiers, uh, would be like zero. And that's not, that's, that should, should not be the case. So, well, you know, when I visited uh, Afghanistan in March, I also met with, as you said, with, with uh, Mr. Vardak, who has been around for some time and has seen many transitions in one way or, on, or another. And of course, uh, he has also, also has the right to be uh, wondering about the future and also, also of course, concerned about, about the future. And I think we all share his, his concern. So one of the signals we should send out in Chicago is, is definitely the one that the international community will remain not only tuned but present, actively present and, and uh, function, fu functioning in, in Afghanistan also after 2000, 2014. From a Finnish point of view, we are reducing our number of, of soldiers in Afghanistan like many other countries do, but we are increasing our humanitarian aid and also investments in education, military education, uh, because that's, of course, one of the capabilities the Afghans will, will need, need in the long run. Uh, Finland's commitment to Afghanistan, we don't have any, any uh, so to say, national reasons for, for being there, be, besides all the values that we want to defend as a member of the international community. We think it's very important that human rights are respected in, in Afghanistan, that, that young girls can attend school, that women can, can be in working life. These are Nordic Finnish values that we really want to defend also by being present in Afghanistan. And we're also ready to, to uh, commit in the burden sharing after 2014 uh, in, in the way that we will, we will figure out later, but of course, uh, definitely also in a financial, financial way. Then talking about the Arctic area, maybe just briefly to leave some, some time for other questions. It's of course very important that the Arctic area remains as secure and peaceful as possible. That goes for the military side, of course, but there are also many other aspects and dimensions talking about the, the Arctic area. For instance, the environmental issues, climate change is very much about the, the future of the Arctic area, what's going to happen there. Uh, exploiting uh, national resources, the use of national resources uh, has, also to, uh, has also to be completed in, in a uh, sustainable way, all the way. And uh, this is possible only through international cooperation, through, through mutual, mutual understanding, uh, trusting each other, but also respecting those who live in these areas, the indigenous people living in these areas have to be respected all the time because we're talking about their everyday life, their roots and their future. So um, we have the, the, the treaty sector, we have the, the very much practical humanitarian uh, approach talking about, about the, the future uh, of the Arctic areas. And uh, Finland is very proud to, to be a partner, a member of the Arctic Council and in that, in that way and that respect also, also carry its responsibilities for the peaceful development and peaceful future of the Arctic area. Well, thank you, Mr. Minister. I'd like to talk further about multi, uh, multinational defense cooperation on some icebreakers, but we'll have that for another <coughs> seminar. I have a question over here, sir. Thank you. Just one moment. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Mr. Minister, my name is Terry Murphy. I have an association with CSIS, but my real claim to fame is that I come from the county that houses what formerly Suomi College and now Finlandia University. And I can pronounce Likala and Jaskalainen and all sorts of names, mm. even though I have no Finnish <coughs> blood. My question to you, sir, and I have a lot of contacts with Finland and, and many social friends, including your ambassadors, friend, personal friends. That's the, that's the, that's the lead-in. The question is to pick up on your statement about um, n your, your government's decision not to seek membership in NATO during this term in office, as I heard you correctly. Could one assume from that, rightly or wrongly, that that might possibly be a matter that would be discussed in the 
whatever the future election might be, so the future government might have a mandate to act. Uh, Mr. Minister, I actually would like to add a little onto that. Thank you for that question. That I, last fall, you were quoted as saying, and this was in terms of some of the defense cuts that, that uh, you're wrestling with right now, you noted that if continuous savings reduce our defense ability, this will in turn lead to a defense deficit which must be filled in other ways. In practice, this means that all additional savings increase the need to join the alliance. Were you opening a door there as well, if additional cuts uh, have to be borne by the ministry? Thank you. Well, to start with Mr. Murphy's question. Murphy, yes. yeah. Uh, the Finnish, uh, sorry? Murphy. Murphy. <laughs> Mur that's right. Uh, we know the Murphy's law, of course, but that's, oh. a, di that's a different thing. <laughs> well, uh, Finnish foreign policy is defined in uh, in the government program, which uh, comes into force when the government starts its, its work, and it's uh, usually valid for the four-year the go four government mm -hmm. term, and uh, functions as a kind of roadmap for the government. And it's, the importance of the, the program has become even, even has grown all the time because of the, the f rapid changes in the world and the world economy, European economy has forced us to, to stick to the, the roadmap just to be, to be sure that we're on the right track. So in the, the, the six-party government, coalition government we have right now, it's a quite uh, broad government uh, with parties from the left-wing alliance to the conservatives, the Green League, the Christian Democrats, the Social Democrats, my party, Swedish People's Party, which is, which is a liberal party. Um, that means also that, of course, the government program is uh, one big compromise. So, talking about the the definition, I in fact quoted directly from the the government program uh, about the Finnish uh, relationship to NATO. That will be valid for at least up to well the spring of 2015 when the government term, term end, ends. And what's going to happen then, if anything, that's up to the next government, to the next parliament. So it's absolutely impo impossible to to speculate about what's going to happen after that. But I, I do believe that if, if there would be, a, would be a change in the Finnish uh, way of looking at, at NATO membership that would uh, require or lead to maybe the hen or the egg to a change in the public opinion. And the public opinion right now is very much against a Finnish NATO membership. About 30% is mm -hmm. in favor of NATO membership and 70% against. So I guess if... if um, if we, we could ever uh, be a member of the, 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 the alliance, that we would have to, to measure the, the, will of the, the will of the people in some way. If it's a referendum or just uh, a decision by, by a parliament with a broad majority, that's not uh, easy to say right now, but, but uh, we need to have, to have a green light from the, from the public opinion. But of course, we also need political leadership when Finland joined the European Union or applied for membership uh, in, uh, in early 1992, uh, it was possible only because the, the president, Mauno Koivisto at the time, took a very active role and started to, to advocate the Finnish membership in, in the European uh, Union. The public opinion also started to change more in favor, to being in favor of that membership after the, the very strong leadership of the president and also the government at the time. So I guess we would need some, some kind of, uh, the same kind of, of uh, strong leadership combined with also a, a, a change in the, in the public opinion if uh, membership application would ever, ever be sent to Brussels. In fact, I didn't answer your oh, question. Oh, okay. well, Sorry. Um, I was going to come back. <laughs> yeah, yes, please. Uh, in fact, um, I think I said exactly last last autumn that the, the budget cuts and, and so on will obviously lead to a situation where, where a NATO me membership will be used in the public debate as a, as a possibility. But at the same time, I don't think uh, we can cut our uh, budget cut our, our way to, to NATO because I don't think NATO will accept a country that is, has uh, kind of, of uh, 
rejected its own arms for armed forces. That's not what we're doing, but, but that's, that's not the way it could be. We have to have a strong, <coughs> capabil strong capabilities. We have to have a, uh, a national trust in our own defense forces, because if we don't trust our own defense forces, nobody else does. <coughs> so, so NATO membership is much more about what I just said in my answer to Mr. Mr. Murphy. And of course, making, uh, taking a maximum out of international cooperation also in the military field could also be an argument for, for applying for membership. But that's, that's uh, not a question for this, this government term. Uh, we have to wait. Very good. We will wait. Uh, Mr. Minister, my name is David Wagner. Uh, you've discussed the uh, non-traditional roles of the Finnish Defense Forces, but the traditional role uh, was territorial defense, and I imagine that is still the top priority for the Defense Forces today. Uh, for historical reasons, Finland has always assumed that it does the job alone. And, but the uh, Lisbon Treaty introduced a security guarantee for all UN members. And I was wondering if you could discuss how uh, Finnish uh, territorial defense doctrine might have changed in the wake of the Lisbon Treaty. Yeah, thank you. Well, the Lisbon Treaty is, is in force, of course. I feel as a member of the European Union, and we are really having high expectations as far as the, the common security and, and uh, defense policy is concerned, including also the pooling and sharing thing, of course, I was just referring to in my speech. But at the same time, Finland has to make sure that our own military forces are uh, in a good shape, because uh, we will always have national interests, national, uh, the national dimension, talking about, uh, about uh, the, the common European sector. So the, the thing we can do is to make sure that, that our own military capabilities are, are accurate, that the, the uh, uh, level of, the, of equipment, material, is uh, all right, and uh, that the public opinion trusts the, the Finnish abilities and capabilities. Right now we are, in fact, uh, in the middle of a quite huge defense reform, like almost all, all other European countries have completed or are in the middle of the same kind of, of reform. Finland is also doing the same thing, and it's, of course, about cutting the budget. We have to reduce our military budget by about 10% up to 2015. And that, of, of course, means <clears throat> a lot of quite frustrating things, like closing bases, which is not popular in the political opposition or amongst the, the public opinion. Uh, also reducing the number of people employed by the military sector. We are sacking people in a couple of, within a couple of years, unfortunately. But we're doing this just, just to, to be able to, to use the, the uh, diminishing amounts of money we have to, uh, for the right purposes, for strengthening the capabilities, getting the right kind of material for the right purposes, and uh, being able to to work as a reliable European transatlantic partner also in the future. So, <clears throat> but the transition period, we're right in the middle of up to 2015, it's quite challenging because uh, every change is, is uh, facing a lot of resistance and opposition. But um, as long as you know that you're doing the right thing and also know that, that the other European countries are doing about the same thing, that uh, makes, makes life a little bit, little bit easier. So um, we believe in the, in the, the common <coughs> European uh, defense and uh, security politic, politics, but we must make sure that our own capabilities are in a good shape, because otherwise we can't contribute to the European mm -hmm. context if we don't rely on ourselves. Thank you, Jonas Hofström, Swedish ambassador to the United States. And thank you for your speech, Mr. Minister. I think it was very well done and describe how far we are when it's come to defense and security operation in the high north. But that also includes in, in the foreign policy area. 
Uh, you mentioned concrete examples. Uh, if you take the combined air forces, Finland, Norway, Sweden and Denmark is a pretty solid and good force. And in the debate, also in the Stoltenberg report, it was uh, mentioned if we can do more to provide security for Iceland, well, what would we call air policing. Do you foresee, is this a good example of Nordic, uh, Nordic defense cooperation? Thank you. I think the Stoltenberg paper, thank you for the question, the Stoltenberg paper is, is a very good, good one. And uh, it was launched in 2009, and uh, it would have deserved even, even more publicity than it got when it, it was launched, because it's, it's a very, very good, good paper. But nevertheless, it's never too late to go back to the paper, and of course, things and time changes and you might suddenly find the answers to the changes in, uh, for instance, this, in this case, the, the, the Stoltenberg report. I think definitely that the, the, the cooperation in, in this very field could be one way of, of uh, tightening the cooperation between the Nordic, Nordic countries. And, and talking about the air policing thing uh, from a Finnish point of view, we are uh, quite interested in, in uh, uh, evaluating the possibilities in a positive way. Uh, and we also know that you're doing the same thing in, in Sweden right now, so, so I think it could, could, could be one, one way forward. In fact, uh, it's not that dram dramatic, uh, such, there's not, not too much dramatics in it, or drama, because it's just one dimension of, of the, the traditional Nordic cooperation. The Nordefco, you could refer to that one, to the, to the, um, to the Stoltenberg report, uh, I think the, the pragmatic way of, of doing cooperation on a Nordic level is more important than the structures or the, 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 uh, the obstacles. We should get rid of the obstacles and do, do more business. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Julia Wittling mclean member of the Swedish People's Party and also representing a U.S. Congress. Um, uh, I would like to ask you a question about um, the development of the Finnish defense. Um, you know that Sweden has foregone the tradition where almost every male is drafted for um, the army. So how do you see uh, in a foreseeable future the development of the Finnish defense? Do you think that this is a step that we will have to take to save, save money and budget costs? Or, and will this bring us closer to NATO? Thank you. The conscription system is <clears throat> has very long roots in Finland, and it means that every every male is obliged to to do his military service. And since 1995, uh, females have a possibility to to do the service, but it's it's a voluntary arrangement. Up to 1995, females were not allowed to the Finnish army. That's of course very special. And it, it was it was. Uh, Unequality, as, as at worst, we have of course evaluated many possibilities during the last years. What what would be the best solution for Finland uh, as a part of the defense reform, but in fact also despite the reform? But we came once again to the conclusion that the conscription system is the best uh, mod model for Finland. It's a very cost-effective model. And it also serves the, the purposes, also the, the law-based law purposes and obligations that the Finnish arms, armed forces have to be able to defend the whole country, the, the ter territorial defense system. But to be able to do that, we need a reserve that is big enough. We're cutting the reserve now as a part of the defense reform from 350,000 to 230,000. But nevertheless, we need... Um, raw material, so to say, to be able to maintain a functioning reserve. And the raw material consists of, of young males and hopefully also more, more females that uh, make, uh, complete their military service and becomes a part of, of the well-educated and well-equipped reserve. But at the same time, we also have to make sure that the, the compulsory military service is uh, relevant uh, in a changing world. We need to make sure that the young people uh, doing the military service 
can get a kind of, of maximum added value pers on a personal level, talking about their future uh, plans, their plans in, in working life or, or education or whatever. And also if you have, of course, working experience from working life or you have studied something very special before you enter the, the army, it should also be taken into account so that you as an individual, but also the military system can benefit on a maximum level from, from, from each other. Mm, it's also important that people doing the military service can maintain uh, functioning everyday relations to the civil society. So that's why all the, the garrisons, the, the, uh, the buildings where the, the uh, people live while, while doing the military service, they, are connected, they, they will be connected to wireless internet, for instance. So it's going to be possible to have your iPad tuned and online. Thank goodness. For instance, <laughs> well, not, maybe not in the forest, but, but uh, just you know, to make sure that, for instance, you can, you can uh, apply for jobs or, or, uh, or advance in your studies or something in your leisure time. Uh, it should not be an isolated period of life. It should be an integrated period of life during your military service. So it will be more, more relevant also from, from a... In, from a broad perspective. Fantastic. Well, I'm, unfortunately, our time uh, is up, but I know we could go on for a while. This has been a, a, a wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much for your thoughtful and insightful questions. Mr. Minister, thank you. You've given us a real tour de force and helped us get ready for Chicago in 10 days. The countdown has begun, and it's been an op a privilege to hear from such an important partner country uh, how vibrant and vital that partnership is with NATO. We thank Thank you. We thank the government for their contributions and for your leadership. And please join me in thanking the minister for a fantastic presentation.